All right. So, you know, I think we'll just go down the line of how the boxes appear on my screen. So I'll just kind of ask you one by one to give you each a chance to answer these questions, if that works for you. Um, so if you want, we'll start with Tim. So Janelle and Lisa, if you want to mute yours. Um, Tim, let's just start with when it comes to mental health and kids and teens, what are you seeing? Are you seeing increases in anxiety, depression, suicide, suicide attempts, et cetera? What are you seeing? So across the board, we're seeing um, an increase in anxiety. So, so just general anxiety. Uh, I think that a, a lot of times the, the unknown uh, creates, creates not only anxiety for young people, but also for adults. So across the board, we're seeing an increase in, of over, in, overall anxiety. I think there is um, a level of depression that's, that's increased. Um, I will say that fortunately um, within our community, within specifically in Johnson County, we've actually seen a reduction in um, youth suicides. Uh, and that, I think that's probably because of the efforts that we've put in place prior to the pandemic. Um, we've built some level of resilience um, with that. So fortunately, um, while one's too many to die by suicide, we have seen a slight decrease um, uh, in the last two years. Well, that's especially impressive considering all that, that our kids have to deal with right now. And when you talk about seeing anxiety, do some of the symptoms you're seeing and some of the things that you're hearing, does it vary by age group? I mean, obviously a high schooler might have very different concerns and anxiety related issues compared to what a grade schooler might have. So does it differ by age group? Yeah, I think um, it does differ um, by age group. It also differs by um, the individual's environment and, and all of those things. I think the most important thing to realize though is that anxiety um, and stress is normal. <laughs> and so it's when it becomes to overtake your life um, and whenever you're not able to function like you're normally able to function, that's when it becomes a problem. So I, I, I think it's really important for us to to make sure that we're letting um, both kids and, and, and young adults know that anxiety um, and stress is part of life. Uh, and so it, it's really when it becomes too overwhelming, that's when we really need to focus on it. That's such a good point, a great distinction there. Janelle, let's switch over to you. Um, and again, and I have, I have some follow-up questions, so we'll move back on down uh, as, as we come to it. So Tim, if you wanna mute yours, we'll go on to Janelle. Um, what about you? What are you seeing in your school district? What kinds of issues are you noticing kids are having when it comes to mental health during this pandemic? I would absolutely echo what Tim said. Um, anxiety is definitely something that we're seeing with our kids. And I think that the pandemic and what we've experienced has just exacerbated that with kids. Um, we're noticing that any kid that had um, any type of anxiety around school uh, now trying to come back and reintegrate into face-to-face -face when they've been home for so long really just magnifies all of those anxieties that they had. Um, and then, you know, trying to get back into the rigor of the classroom environment and being there um, with other students around has really been difficult for kids. And so it's easy to sort of fall back into um, you know, wanting to stay at home and wanting to isolate themselves, which I think just lends itself to uh, depression in kids. So I, I think those two things coupled together, I think Tim's exactly right, that that's absolutely what we're seeing. And are you noticing a difference when it comes to the age groups? You know, is it, are, are some of the anxieties different for the younger kids versus your older students and, and depression more so in one age group than the other? I think what we're noticing is that there's been such an increase of students on social media and their use of social media uh, during this time that I, I would say that the symptoms that we see with kids, um, we're still seeing those same type of depression and anxiety issues, um, but the symptoms we see are a little different. And, I, and I, we're seeing a lot of really internalized things with older kids. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of that comes from just the isolation um, of, of being at home. And then I think even social media with how much it's intended to bring people together really just tends to, to isolate kids who are already feeling like they're kind of on the fringes um, or maybe not fitting in. Uh, that just sort of magnifies that for them and, and just increases those, you know, that sense of isolation. Yeah. Do you have, have you had more parents who have been reaching out to you saying, I'm concerned about my son or daughter during this pandemic? Definitely, we've, we've absolutely heard more from our parents and relative to you know switching from 
virtual to in-person learning, um, just not knowing what to do to help their kids. Um, and I think as parents, that's the most important part. The, the fact that they're recognizing that there's a problem and, and asking us to partner with them is really, really important. So just knowing your kid and what their baseline is and then knowing that they're struggling is really important, but definitely have more parents reaching out. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, when we circle back when we talk about your advice for parents. So I will definitely come back to that. Thank you, Janelle. Lisa, um, we'll go ahead, we'll, we'll segue into you now if you want, same question. What have you seen during this pandemic? How has this pandemic affected our kids and their mental health? Great question. And um, really just want to echo the sentiments that have been shared about how we support students. And, and our data shows that there has been certainly an uptick, 160% um, increase from last year in the number of suicide assessments that we have completed this year, 354 assessments. We have 56 behavioral health social workers kindergarten through 12th grade that provide that one-to-one -one support and case management for students that are in crisis. And so that data tells us that there are certainly students that are struggling with what was just mentioned with anxiety and with depression. Um, and while that number may be alarming and that increase of 160, that uptick, also what it tells us is the mechanisms that we have in place. We have a, like I stayed at 56 behavioral social workers and we have a licensed clinical social worker um, on my team, a behavioral health coordinator um, that leads the work in this district and supports them. And what it tells us is that students know how to reach out and are getting the support that they need. And those are, of those assessments, those are lives that have been saved and it is really in tandem with our behavioral health social workers and our counselors, the support they're providing to our students, what we're seeing um, during a time where our students, our families, and uh, as well as adults were isolated during this time um, when on the onset of the pandemic. And just to clarify, when you say you guys are doing more suicide assessments, is that because a teacher has noticed something concerning or a parent has noticed something concerning, just to make sure I understand that, what, what, what does that entail? So the policies that we would put in place by the leadership of our behavioral health coordinator, anyone can make that referral. A parent can make a referral. A policy that we put in place is that that referral is online and accessible to any staff member. And of course, our students can self-refer uh, for the services they need from any of our behavioral health social workers. So over the last three years, pre pandemic, we were making sure that we were putting those behavioral health services and the needs of our students, um, prioritizing them so we can reduce those disruptions in the classroom and really help them to develop that skill set they need to manage. Um, I think, um, as was mentioned earlier, that we know that life can bring on anxiety, life changes, um, just transitional changes um, from pre-adolescence to young adults, all of those things. And what is important in our district is that we're providing that foundation around that social, emotional, um, whole child approach. Um, and so those mechanisms were being developed and policies were changing in our district. And now our students and our staff, and not that we don't ever have room to grow in any opportunity, we don't, never arrive. How can we strengthen our services to best meet the needs of our students? When you're talking about doing these suicide assessments, these are at-risk students who are going through something, certainly. Are you seeing this more with older students or do you have to do these even with some of your younger students? Uh, our suicide assessments are um, obviously any of our behavioral social workers can assess a student early childhood through 12th grade. We see them at all levels, including um, elementary school. Um, I think that what the pandemic exposed is the ability for our students to regulate their level of dysregulation, right? What are they experiencing? How do they talk about it? And I think obviously um, that isolation exacerbated that, which also was mentioned earlier, um, because when you're in school, you can navigate those resources. You have relationships with your teachers and your counselor. Um, and so it just really exposed the need that we have. And we're certainly grateful for the leadership of our district, the commitment to our board to have behavioral health social workers and 73 counselors in place to support our students across the district. That is huge. And so since we're already on this topic, we'll start this way and we'll go back on down the line. So now we're kind of focusing on um, the resources that are in place. So you already, you already talked about some, but um, I'm just, so I'm asking you kind of again, so just running the gamut, 
What are some of the resources your school district provides to help students and their families when it comes to mental health? Absolutely. So as I indicated, uh, the priority we have around mental health is that we have a behavioral health coordinator in our district that leads the work for behavioral social workers in the Department of Student Services. We provide through the work of our on-site school-based behavioral health social workers one-to-one -one interventions struggling with some of those behaviors that we just talked about are symptomatic right of any of those mental health disorders. Um, group interventions focused on anger management, grief and loss and healthy relationship. Crisis intervention right when we talk about what's happening especially with the onset of the pandemic classroom support and insight and advocacy during those um, opportunities for our behavioral health social workers to collaborate with classroom teachers, um, classroom um, support educators with our administrative team, really deepening the understanding of not what's wrong with this child, but what happened so that we can respond accordingly. Most importantly, with the onset of our behavioral health social workers is that they can leverage home visits to assist our families. Again, that whole child approach. When we think about those home visits, we think about providing them the opportunity to navigate resources, problem solving those behavioral issues, safety concerns, and then of course, suicide assessments that I spoke about earlier. Some other things that we put um, in place early on as we navigated the pandemic is that we have a 24 hour care line that any of our students can leverage to call, especially if they are in crisis, especially when we weren't in person and we were in remote learning. And most recently, um, through the vision of our behavioral health coordinator, we have developed a behavioral um, health clinic. And so that Care Clinic is offered every Tuesday and Thursday, geographically at two ends of our district boundaries so that we can provide services again for any children, young adult, kindergarten through 12th grade. And we offer that to help identify the safety gap. We work closely with our mental health agency that's our partner in this, especially if students are in crisis. So we really wanna make sure in addition to those resources, we obviously then make them um, them being our students aware of that, right? We make sure that those numbers and access to this information and resources, um, especially 1-800 um, hotlines are all available and displayed in our schools because we have to make sure, I'm not sure who mentioned it, but social media certainly is the platform for our young adults. So we have to reach them where they are and normalize that it's okay not to be okay as we navigate uncertainty. And so that is what we're doing to make sure that we can continue again in reflection upon what we're doing and what we're hearing from our community, how we can only improve the services we're providing for our students in tandem with our community partners. We cannot do it without our community partners. Yeah, definitely a, a group effort for sure. Wow, you guys are doing a lot. Lisa, thank you. Janelle, uh, it's gonna your turn here. So as we move over to you now, same question. We know there's a need, you're seeing a need. What is your skill, school district doing trying to help students and meet them where they are? Yeah, so very similar to what Lisa talked about. Um, in our own staff, uh, we have 50 counselors, 25 social workers, most of whom are licensed, um, and uh, resource specialists as well. And then we have 25 school psychologists. So, um, but as Lisa mentioned, we could not do this without leveraging, leveraging our community partners. So we are very fortunate in Clay County to have the Clay County Children's Services Fund. Um, and this is um, a countywide tax, sales tax, um, that offers us an opportunity to provide services in our district that we may not have been able to provide without uh, those funds. So we connect with partners such as um, our local mental health agency, Tri-County Mental Health, um, Synergy Services, Maddie Rhodes Center, and, and provide um, on-site um, therapeutic services to students during the day. We've had 186 students so far this year uh, take advantage of that. Uh, we also have expressive therapy groups that are offered, so music therapy and art therapy during the day. Um, and, and again, these things I think just really create access to families that, that may not have been there before. So families that would struggle with um, transportation or or just uh, finding the appointment and, and getting to those appointments regularly, uh, this just creates more access 
for them and and we could not do that without those partners so those are really important things that we're doing but on the other end of the spectrum prevention is really important and uh, we have a lot of preventative services in place um, like Lisa mentioned we, we do assessments um, but we also have started this year um, a district-wide suicide prevention program called the Hope Squad. And, and this is all about creating an environment where um, our kids know that it's okay to talk about mental health. It's okay to support one another and to, to bring these issues to the surface. And, and it's okay, like Lisa said, it's okay not to be okay. And, and that's really important for our kids to understand and creating that kind of community around mental health and emotional health and, and normalizing that, um, that we're all going to struggle from time to time. And so I think those preventative services are really important to mention as well. Um, and then we work really closely with our local mental health agency um, to, to provide additional supports um, targeted at other um, specific mental health issues or you know maybe kids are turning to substances um, to deal with some of the things that they're they're um, seeing in their lives and so those uh, services are all really important as well so that's a lot of what we're doing doing here oh, well it sounds like it sounds like a lot is it just me or are schools really treating mental health differently now than when we were growing up. It just seems as though there is such, there's a much larger presence in terms of counselors, therapists, et cetera, in schools than what I remember. Yeah, I think as schools, we know that to be successful academically and in life, um, we, we have to address the whole child. We have to teach to the whole child. And unless we can ensure that their basic needs are met, and that includes their mental health and their safety and their well-being, uh, that we're not going to see that type of success. And I think that schools are uniquely positioned to offer the kinds of resources that families and kids need. And in partnership with parents, we can provide a lot of that. So um, we know when one person in the family is struggling, that can be chaotic and difficult for the whole family. So again, just creating that access and making it easy to navigate, uh, that's what we see our role as uh, and, and connecting people to those resources that they need. So yeah, I think it is much different than it, than it used to be. Well, I, I certainly think that's a positive change, definitely, especially for those families who don't have access to resources, you know, as easily, or maybe time is a constraint to, you know, getting therapy or counseling outside of school. So I think it's fantastic that that's offered in schools now. Tim, we've been talking so much about the importance of partnering with outside agencies. How much does your organization at the county level work with schools in Johnson County, and, and what kind of resources are you offering, especially since the pandemic hit? So uh, absolutely, I, I think it's all about um, partnerships, and and so um, both of uh, the school districts um, here today have mentioned their collaboration with their local community mental health centers, and I think that's important to to point out because I do um, agree um, that schools are uniquely positioned to provide these services in partnership with community mental health centers. And so every community has those two things. They have community mental health centers and they have school districts. And I think that those two entities are working better um, together than they ever have. And, and I think it started well before the pandemic and I think it prepared us um, to be able to manage um, this pandemic a little bit differently than maybe we would have been able to um, say five or six years ago. So I think within Johnson County, we work with all six um, of the school districts in the same ways that were just described. Uh, I think that you know the other piece that I probably would mention is that um, it's also important um, for people to know that we have a 24-hour crisis line. So um, that that that's we're we're part of the national um, suicide prevention hotline. So soon um, in July of, of, of this year, we'll be moving to um, a 988 system where you can dial 988 and, and get to talk with a, um, a mental health professional. And, and so we have those mechanisms in place right now uh, and, and be able to provide that so that people know how to reach out for help when they need it, that parents know how to reach out for help when we need it, need it. and so that you don't really need to know um, which door to look behind that you just need to know that either you go to the school or you go to your community mental health center and they're going to get you connected with the level of service and, and the level of care that you need. 
are you doing anything differently? Have you had to utilize more virtual options because of the pandemic, um, operating more on social media, anything that you've changed to tailor it to this unique situation we find, found ourselves in? Absolutely. We, we, we had to make a huge adjustment to kind of pivot because the far majority of our services that we provide were in the community. So where people live, um, where they work um, and, and, and where they play. And, and for kids, a lot of that work is done in the schools uh, and, and at their homes. And so we have had to pivot. And so we've, we've gotten really effective at utilizing um, telehealth. Uh, but I think it's also important to realize that not everybody has the ability um, to have telehealth and, and, and accessibility. And so there always has to be, there's had to be this, this hybrid version um, so that we can provide services in person when we need to, but that we also are able to provide um, and supplement those services with telehealth services. So yeah, I think we've, we've all had to manage just like the schools have had to adapt to a virtual environment. We've had to adapt to that virtual environment as well. But what we both know is that kids learn better in person and actually people also um, recover better from their struggles when you're able to communicate with them. That human to human interaction in person is, is really, really powerful. And I think that, that we have to find a way to make sure that we ensure that that happens. Wow, really? So having a counseling session one-on-one, -on -one, therapy one-on-one -on -one in person is still more beneficial than doing it like we're doing it right now? I think there would probably be people that would debate that back and forth. From my perspective, um, the, the interaction that you get um, from that human to human connection, being able to see the nonverbal cues, being able to connect uh, on a more human level, face to face, person to person, I think is always going to overcome um, the, the technology. Technology brings a lot of things, but it also is not the answer to a lot of things. And I think there's, um, you know, one of the things I think was mentioned earlier is that that whole notion of loneliness. Um, you know, what our kids have been experiencing, um, they were experiencing these things well before the pandemic. The pandemic has only exacerbated and brought light to it. So one of the things that I find interesting is that despite us being the most technologically advanced society in the world ever, in world history, we had kids and we've had adults report that they're more lonely than ever. And so honestly, I think that, that um, what the pandemic has done is brought some light to how important it is for us um, to, be, to remain socially connected. You know, early on in the pandemic, people said, we needed to, um, to stay socially distanced. And that was, in my, my mind, the wrong term. We needed to stay physically distanced from one another, but we need to remain socially connected. We're social creatures. And so I think that, again, a lot of stuff that kids were experiencing, they were experiencing those things well beyond, uh, well before the pandemic. It's just been exacerbated and, and, and brought to light um, to the schools, to the mental health center, to our community as a whole, so that we can more effectively address those things. And Janelle, that really, anxiety is the big one and depression, but a lot of loneliness, a lot of loneliness. So God bless you all for the, the resources that you're giving to parents and, and to students. But as, as a parent, what can we do as parents, Tim? What can we do for our kids if we notice that they seem anxious or we notice that they seem lonely and we don't know how to reach them? What do you recommend? So the first thing that I think is, is important is to, is to basically listen, um, to ask questions, to seek to understand how they're feeling, to, um, to validate those feelings and to make sure that they know that those are normal feelings. Um, but that also to keep an eye on it and re routinely check in with your youngster about how they're doing, because then you'll be able to determine whether this is a normal part of coping or if they need some professional intervention. And I think the other thing um, it, that is important is that we have to, in, in this time and age of so many things that we don't control right now, you know, the pandemic in, in a lot of respects is, is in control. We need to focus and parents need to spoke, focus on what they can control. And that is the narrative that they give their children and that they want to impart um, onto their kids. You know, is that a narrative that, that, we've, that we are, this is impossible, that we can't overcome it, that we are somehow um, being hurt by this? Or do we want to um, look at a narrative empowerment and resilience? 
and I think it's so important that parents um, listen to their kids and then support their kids and find ways that they can work um, to build that resilience. Um, I would argue that between the schools and the work the mental health centers are doing and the mental health providers in our community, we are going to have a generation of very, very, very resilient young people as we move forward um, because they've had to face a lot over the last two years. We all have. Um, but I think that, that with youngsters, um, as we continue to, to support them, uh, we'll see that they, they've built that resilience. So I think really for parents, it's important to listen to their kids um, and provide that support and provide that, that opportunity to be positive. Um, and what narrative they want to move forward. Hey, we know our kids take a lot of their cues from us and they're watching and they're paying attention. So that's really important to note. Last question, Tim, and then ladies, I'll, I'll move back the other way down. We're hearing from a lot of parents who've said, hey, we've recognized that our kid needs a little extra help and we've looked for mental health services, but a lot of them aren't accepting new patients. Are, are you seeing that and why? Yeah, I think that there is absolutely a lack of mental health professionals. Um, it, there's, a, there's simply a workforce um, shortage issue, and, and that really started prior to the pandemic, but it, again, it's one more thing that's just been exacerbated by the pandemic. And, and the fact is, is that most mental health centers, um, most um, school districts that are looking for social workers and for psychologists, there is a lack of those behavioral health um, specialties out there. And so I think that that is um, one thing that, that we need to be aware of, that the availability to those professional staff um, are not necessarily as available as maybe they were um, five or six years ago. The second thing is, is that I think it's um, important for us to realize that for whatever reason, mental health historically has not been treated the same as mental health. And so when parents um, reach out to um, their insurance companies or whatever, and they find out that, that, that they may not have as much coverage or that it might um, require a, a copay, the fact is, is that there's not parity um, between mental health and physical health. And really that's something that we need to address within our nation uh, and, and as, as a community that we really need to treat mental health as physical health. And if that's, that's another thing I think that has been brought forward by the pandemic is that you, know, you can't have good public health without good mental health. Uh, and you ha can't provide a good learning environment if kids are, are not, if, if their social and emotional needs are not met. Uh, and so I think those are all kinds of things that we have to, have to be aware of. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. Janelle, so we, we were just talking about the fact that there aren't enough mental health providers out there. So if parents recognize there's a need, if parents are looking to get their child some help and can't find an available therapist, is there anything that you at the school district level can do to help? Sure. We always uh, recommend to our parents that they reach out to us and partner with us. Um, because we have some of those community relationships that we can leverage and we can assist them in, in helping to find the help that they need for their child. So I think it's always a good idea to just to involve us. I know sometimes that seems a little overwhelming or scary, um, but then in the meantime, there's things that we can put in place at the, at the school that could help their child uh, to navigate some of the difficulties that they're seeing. So uh, if it's something that we know about, then it's definitely something that we can help with. So I would absolutely recommend parents reach out. Hey, that's a great resource to know if you can't find it on your own, turn to the school and ask the school if they can help. Do you have any other advice for parents who have kiddos that might be struggling? Anything that we as parents can do? So I would echo a lot of what Tim said, um, but also uh, probably the thing that I would say to parents is that the most dangerous thing you can do is think this won't be my child. This won't be my kid that's struggling. Um, and so making sure that, that you are, you know, talking to your kids, like Tim said, and listening and knowing really what their baseline is. So where does your kid normally function? How does your kid normally interact with you and with others? Do you see them pulling back from some of that? Are they not friends with people they used to be friends with or not interested in things?
things they used to be interested in, um, and, and then making it okay to talk about uh, mental health and how people are feeling at home. And, and like Tim said, controlling that narrative um, about we can be resilient and we um, things can be hard and we can um, push through those things, um, but it's important to support one another in that and to be able to say that I'm not okay and I need some help right now or I might need somebody to help me through this. I think that that's really important and having those conversations at home uh, is really beneficial as well. Excellent advice. I know we're getting close to our window, Lisa, so I'll make this uh, my last question for you because I know you have a student that you need to, to get to. Answering the same question, if, if parents can't find a therapist on their own, is there anything that your school district can do to help? And do you have any other advice for parents? Sure, absolutely. Um, so as I shared before, uh, our behavior health coordinator, Angela Dunn, has launched our care clinic that provides after hours. In addition to that layered work, we do contract with therapists that provide on-site services at some of our high schools and through our mental health provider that we work with in the community, um, which is PACES, um, Vibrant Health. We partner with our local community behavioral health agencies that provide that support. And I think that that is equally important um, when we think about the support that's offered after hours, during hours. Again, we have 56 amazing so behavioral health social workers. Um, and we also have 73 amazing counselors that are providing that tier one support by delivering that social emotional learning curriculum, by providing just what we heard from my colleagues about building that resiliency, building those skill sets they need to problem solve, to identify their emotions, to speak about them, to label them, to know when to really seek help. Um, and one other thing that we have been really um, uh, have such gratitude about in our district is that we have a trauma sensitive and resilient schools initiative and it's not a product it's who we are and how we show up for our students and so these things were really put in place through my department uh, pre the pandemic right not knowing what was really in front of us um, just a year and a half later and so really knowing how to support our staff and how to support our staff and how they respond to our students i think is incredibly important um, students need those basic maslow hierarchy of needs and we need to make sure that we're addressing them so they can be present um, in the learning right so that we are supporting um, students that we want to thrive and be successful academically and productive citizens so we have some mechanisms in place uh, by contracting with a therapist our own um, team of behavioral health social workers, our own team of school counselors, really providing the skill set that they need, which is important, and really providing those after our resources and resources during the day. And my guidance to parents would be much of what was already echoed, right? What's the baseline for your own son or daughter? And to make sure you're listening and affirming and validating, and most importantly, don't dismiss it. Um, as we heard from Tim, that we need to make sure that this is um, such a national awareness, not just about physical health, but mental health, because you can't see it. And because it doesn't always look like a young person that may be physically depressed or physically withdrawn. We have students that are experiencing depression that look like they're thriving. And so we have to affirm and really normalize what that looks like for our youth and make sure that we're careful not to one uh, shame or dismiss it like you'll be okay, like you'll get through this. And also most importantly, um, when we're listening to students that we as adults don't jump in to fix it. If we're going to empower our students and really um, encourage them to navigate these um, emotions independently and to build that resiliency, we have to ha allow them to experience maybe sadness and grief. It's part of the cycle of life and, and um, disappointment. And so what do we do and how do we respond to that? And that means that parents, uh, we want to hear from them. We want them to reach out for that support. And we want them to know that we would treat mental health as we would a, a limb that's been broken. If you broke your arm, you would go see someone. If a student is experiencing anxiety and depression, are they withdrawn? Are they having some sadness? How do we respond to that? And sometimes it will be services beyond what a school day can provide. And sometimes it's in that moment by having resources available and a student is very responsive and can navigate that because they have some of that resiliency um, in place. So that comes with trust. So we're asking that our students and our community and our family um, 
are vulnerable and work to trust us so that we can be the best support to them that we can um, when we support their family. Yeah, very important. Well, we have uh, maybe one minute, then I, I need to run upstairs to get ready for our four o'clock. Was there anything really pressing that any of you wanted to share that pertains to this conversation? Any stories, kind of anecdotal that you could share that would help to kind of, you know, drive the point home? I just don't want to end this without giving you that opportunity. Well, I don't know that I have really a specifically a story, but I think that I think that Lisa mentioned this, that it's really, um, it has to be a community effort that where we have this conversation. So I just wanna say that I appreciate um, you all having this, facilitating this conversation and, and bringing light and, and, and approaching it from a positive um, uh, point of reference, because I think, that's, I think that's the key. You know, if I think about, um, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we wouldn't talk about cancer. Um, you know, it was the C word. And so today, being able to have this conversation um, and, and being able for you all to have this on air, to talk about mental health, to talk about the struggles that we have, um, I think this is a huge um, step in the right direction. And so um, I just wanna say how much I appreciate um, having the opportunity to be able to do this and, and how proud I am that we've gotten to the point where we can openly talk about um, the struggles that each and every one of us have. And I, I feel like my narrative is uh, perhaps not one specifically related to a student, right? Those are such um, held in such a sacred place and, and confidentiality. But what I do want to share is that at exactly what Tim shared, that we are talking about this, that we are part of normalizing what this conversation looks like. And to the leadership in which I'm employed for the Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools, that I am able to speak about the positions or responses um, that we have a social emotional learning coordinator, that we have a behavioral health coordinator that is leading this work, a trauma sensitive um, and resilient schools coordinator that's helping to deepen that level of understanding of who we are for students and that we have Certainly, I could always say maybe not enough, but the fact that I can articulate, we have 56 social workers and 73 counselors, and there's not a gap early childhood through 12th grade, um, that if we really are going to prioritize teaching and learning, that we have to address this in tandem. It's not one or the other. Um, and so the fact that our board and our superintendent prioritizes this work um, so that we really can get to the, um, teaching and learning, right, the rigor and helping to produce productive citizens that are graduating on track and on time, that I am just, um, you know, you just really, I think, overwhelmed by the opportunity to share what we're doing for our families and how we are going to continue to make sure that's the focus when we think about providing support for the whole child. Again, this is a community effort. It's not schools, it's not just the parents, it's not just the uh, community agencies. This is all of us together. And I, I think that that's the best that we can do for our kids is to move forward together in partnership um, and, and navigate this uh, as a community. So thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Well, thank you to all three of you. Honestly, I'm a big believer in taking care of your mental health. I'm passionate about the issue. And you've told me something that helps with my own kids. So. If you've helped me, then hopefully when we air this, you know, this can help some of our parents out there too who have questions.